It's always a joy to consider the Word of God. It's always a joy to be at the feet of Jesus and hear from the Lord, from His Word, um, what God would have us do. I will speak to you on a subject I've entitled Bronze for Gold. Bronze for Gold. Let's bow our heads as we pray. Father in heaven, we thank you this morning. We thank you, dear Lord, for your presence. We thank you for your power. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that the songwriter has it so right when he sings the blood that Jesus shed way back on Calvary. That blood will never, ever lose its power. We thank you, dear Lord, because it reaches to the highest mountain and then it flows to the lowest valley. Oh, that blood is what we plead today. In Jesus' name, amen. Bronze for gold. Bronze for gold. Most people seem to be in agreement that one of the most important aspects of everyday living is that of decision-making or problem-solving. I don't know about you, but I tend to believe this to be true. In essence, we are the sum total of all the decisions that we have made about life. And I guess the reality constitutes what life is all about. We have to make decisions both big and small. And I'd like to make a case this morning that our values determine the kind of decisions that we make and eventually impact the kind of legacy that we will leave behind. There comes a time in life when faced by the brevity of life and we ponder the kind of legacy that we will leave behind. I put it to you this morning. Whenever we find ourselves asking the question, what will I be remembered by? What sort of legacy will I leave behind? I put it to you today that we need to quickly remember the kind of legacy that we leave behind will always be determined by the kind of values that we hold true. What are your values? What do you value the most? What is the most important thing in your life? Today, we will learn some lessons from an ancient king. We will consider some of the pitfalls in his experience and hopefully gain some insight on how to avoid falling into the same trap. As I, as I grow older, I find that I'm more contemplative in life. I find that I'm asking myself, what sort of legacy am I leaving behind for my daughters, for my wife? I ask myself, I ponder all these questions, and sometimes I second guess some of the bigger decisions that I've made in life, I look back and I'm thinking, it looked and sounded like a good idea then, but then when, when I see the end results and I see the outcome, I think to myself, what was I thinking? I ponder and I question some of the decisions that I've been making. Fortunately, bless your souls, there are some decisions that I'm very happy about. And one of, these, one of such decisions is summarized in Joshua 24, verses 15 and 16, when Joshua poses a question to the Israelites, and he says to them, you decide for yourselves. You make a decision as to who you will serve. As for me and my house, we 
will serve the Lord. And one, that's one of the biggest decisions that I've made in my life for my family. One of the most important and grandest of decisions I have made in my life is that I concur with the words of Joshua that we will serve the Lord in whatever capacity, wherever the Lord would open doors, in whatever experience that the Lord would make possible, we will serve the Lord. And I believe I'm in good company in this church. I see young teachers. I see different personnel that have decided that they will serve the Lord in different capacities, serving humanity. Let me make a transition and begin to let you in on our focus for today and introduce to you uh, our main character for the hour, Rehoboam. Rehoboam. He was born and he had the advantage of, of, of privilege and power. He had an invisible knapsack, if you please. An invisible knapsack of advantage that he could reach into and draw in all the resources that he had. That alone should have set him heads and shoulders above the rest. I need to let somebody know that Rehoboam also had the advantage of pedigree. He had the right genes. He had the right genes. And so his biological constitution, his every being, everything about him, set him up such that he really should have excelled. Whether it is nature or nurture that determines a person's behavior, whether it is the external environment or that which happens within, within an individual, Rehoboam had it all. He could have manipulated his advantage in order to, uh, to, in order to consolidate his position. He was the grandson, after all, he was the grandson of the greatest king that ever lived, King David. He had pedigree behind his name. He was the son of the wisest man that ever lived, Solomon. So he had all this advantage. He had all these things going for him. But unfortunately, even though he had it all, your Bible and my Bible says he lost it all. You don't want to be remembered as that guy. You don't want to be remembered as that guy who had it all, who had so much potential. You could have accomplished so much for the Lord. And this is the legacy of Rehoboam. I'll bring it a bit closer home. You and I as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, I put it to you that we have so much advantage. We, do, we too have this invisible knapsack of advantage. We have the health message. We, 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 have, we have resources on family. We've got a wonderful comprehensive education system. I tell you what, we have a wonderful advantage. We don't want to be remembered as a people that had it all and yet missed out on heaven. What a shame that would be. To have so much potential and yet miss out. I submit to you all that the Seventh-day Adventist message is one of the most beautiful, life-enhancing messages on planet Earth. If you believe that, can I hear you say amen? Whether you believe it or not, it's a fact. It's true. One of the mistakes that Rehoboam makes that I would like us to learn from is that he refuses to listen to wise counsel. One of the most fundamental requirements of decision making is that we ought to listen to sound counsel. This was one of the areas where our, 
our mate, Rehoboam, failed. You have heard the saying, show me your friends. And I will show you the trajectory of your life. Show me the people that you are hanging around, that, that are always around you. And it will be easy for the onlookers to determine the kind of person that you are going to become. It is true that the kind of friends and the company that we keep tends to affect our lives more than we are willing to admit. I know it sounds bad to equate friends with sin. But just like sin, some friends will drag you further away from God than you would ever intended yourself to go. They will keep you there longer than you had budgeted or bargained for. And so we need to choose our friends wisely. Let's go to the Bible. First Kings. Chapter 12. First Kings chapter 12 and verses 1 going down. I'll begin with verse 1. And Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had gone to Shechem to make him king. They had gone to do what, everyone? Is it too hot? You're all falling asleep. Or, or you mind participating in the message? Is that all right? Yeah? They had gone to do what? They had gone to make him king. So let me unpack this scenario a little bit. They had gathered for the coronation of the king, if you please. Everyone's imagination was captivated by hopeful, yes, wishful thinking on what the new government would bring for them. You can understand why the multitude gathered in order to hear the king's rallying calls and, and the kind of vision that he would cast for the nation. They came to hear the kind of tax cuts that the government would implement. They came to hear what subsidies that the students would be getting. The women wanted to hear whether there would be more positions made in parliament for them. They wanted to know whether or not this new king would open up new positions for the women in the, in, in, in the community. Everybody who was anybody, and even the wannabe nobodies were there. This was the kind of event that you didn't want to miss out on. You can almost excuse the gullible excitement that is permeating the air. There's just positive vibes emanating all over the place. Everyone is waiting with bated breath for the king's acceptance speech and his visionary utterances. Everybody is excited. They all want to hear about the strategic plan that Rehoboam would come up with to make Israel great again. They all gathered, and I see the banners. Can you see them with me? They see the banner, Rehoboam, to make Israel great again. And they're all chanting, Israel will be great. Israel will be great. This is the power you participate. What are they chanting? I can't hear you. You're a quiet church, aren't you? They're all chanting, Israel would be great. They, they just excitement in the air. They want to know and find out what new thing is this new king going to bring about. Don't you just love new things? Don't you just love when you get a new manager, you get a new boss, you get a new wife? How about that? You get new something. It's just excitement in the air after all. Even his name, Rehoboam, itself carries the meaning of one that would enhance, unite, and increase the people. Rehoboam, even his name, meant one that brings people together. He, he had the magic about him. They should have been worried. 
they really should have been worried and seen the warning signs when he disregards the gathering and he sends them away for another three days. Can you imagine? You've traveled all from all different places. Everybody was there to hear the king's mandate, to hear, and thus saith the Lord, to hear Rehoboam pronounce, Israel will be great. Again, do you see it flashing? Neon lights, if they had them back in those days. Do you see the banners all over the place? We want Israel. What do we want? Israel, when? Today. And they're all waiting in anticipation. And he stands up and he says, well, I've got nothing much to say to you today. Thank you all for coming. You can all go back home. I have not made up my mind as to the kind of vision that I will give you. You go back home, come back later. The disappointment. Have you ever been disappointed in your life? Just felt deflated. You could, you could almost smell the disappointment or even imagine just the, the disillusionment that they must have had. He was not about to meet their demands. We read in verse 7 that Rehoboam consults the elders. Thank God for elders. Amen. Rehoboam, amen? No? Amen. He consults the elders and listen to what they say in verse 7 of 1 Kings chapter 12. And they spoke to him saying, <clears throat> if you will be a servant to these people today and serve them and answer them and speak good words to them, then they will be your servants forever. Is this good counsel? Is this wise counsel or not? Yes or no? This is beautiful counsel. The elders say to Rehoboam, and they inform him and say, speak favorably to the people. Your mandate is to have unconditional positive regard and respect for all people. And in doing this, you will ensure that the people will be loyal and remain loyal to you all the days of your life. Now, now, pause, church, pause, pause with me. This Right here is wonderful counsel. Speak kindly to the people. Nurture them. Build them up as a leader. This is beautiful counsel, I tell you. To get a glimpse of the kind of man that we're dealing with, let's consider verse 8. Verse 8. But he rejected the advice which the elders had given him and consulted the young men who had grown up with him, who stood before him. He rejects the counsel of the wise men and he embraces the voice of the young men that he had grown up with. Now, one of the biggest mistakes that he makes in this context, you do not do yourself any favors by surrounding yourself with people that will always be telling you how wonderful and how amazing you are. You do yourself no favors by surrounding yourself by people that will always be whispering to your ear the kind of things that you want to hear. This is what Rehoboam does. He consults his friends, and he wants to hear that which he wants to hear. This got me thinking. It got me thinking as to what in our day would constitute the voice of the young man today. You'd be amazed the amount of information that is out there on social media. Voices of the young men. You'd be amazed at how many people are, are adopting values that have nothing to do with the Word of God and are only based 
unpopular opinion, popular culture in the media. That is, which, that is what is being pumped to us day in and day out. The voice of the young people. You get the feeling that Rehoboam is a kind of man that makes decisions that have far-reaching implications and sometimes without giving it much thought. And so the legacy that he leaves is that of a divided, disgruntled people. Israel rebels against him. In verse 1, we are told they had come with a willingness to make him king. They leave rebelling and not, wanting nothing to do with him. Can I just pause parenthetically here? Can I just pause and tell you about another king? The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 4, verse 16 to 19, about another king. When he opened his mouth to speak, the Bible says Jesus, the king of all kings, he opens his mouth and he begins to speak and he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to present the good news of the gospel to all, to pronounce freedom to the captives, sight to the blind. And this is the crux of the gospel. Amen. Setting people free from, from whatever it is that might be bonding them. He goes on to speak in Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 to 12. He speaks and he pronounces blessings. Contrast that with the message of Rehoboam. He had nothing positive to offer. Sometime later, our mate Rehoboam runs into more trouble and he once again demonstrates his lack of decision making and problem solving. Let's go to 2 Chronicles chapter 12. You can find and follow a similar account in 1 Kings 14 and verse 27 where we read that this Rehoboam, one who had it all, he had the pedigree, he had the power, he had the position, and yet he lost it all. We read that when he had established himself and felt that he had strengthened and fortified his garrisons, when he felt that he was strong from all his enemies, when he thought that he was now an accomplished king and that he had no need for anything or anyone else, when he got that promotion that he has always wanted, when he finally marries the girl of his dreams, if you please, when she had attained all her life's ambitions, the Bible says, he, she forsook the Lord. Rehoboam forsakes the law of God, and along with that, he left God. I need to let somebody know today that every time you decide to go here alone and forsake the word of God, you are setting, you're settling for second best. Every time you decide that you can maneuver the horizon of life by yourself and fly solo without God in the picture, you are settling for second best bronze. Every time you compromise your standards and you lower the biblical standards in order to fit in, you are settling for second best bronze. The challenge that I bring to you is that we should be aware of the know-it-all 
I've got life all figured out attitude that was displayed by Rehoboam. One of the lessons that I would like to take from Rehoboam's life is that we should always remain humble and teachable. No matter what title or position that we hold, we should always remain teachable. By the time Shishak of Egypt brings war to Judah's doorstep, it turns out that the king was already compromised. Let me give you some more counsel on problem solving and problem shooting. There are times when you need to step back and actually take time to analyze the situation and analyze the problem. Sometimes we rush in to fix things. We need to consider what will happen if the problem persists. What is the possibility or the implications of more problems resulting from one trying to fix a particular problem? I would hazard an assumption <clears throat> that it could, it could have been a decision that was taken in haste that Rehoboam makes. And I'm here to tell somebody this today. Sit down, analyze. Sit down, study the problem. Assess the situation. And oh, by the way, while you're sitting down and assessing the problem, don't sit too long. Don't sit too long and call too many family meetings. Don't sit too long and call too many board meetings. Don't sit too long and call too many business meetings because there's always a danger of the paralysis from analysis where you're sitting down and you're just analyzing. It's a fine dance, this business of problem solving and making decisions. It's a fine dance and it's not for the faint at heart. To act and solve the problem or not to act and solve the problem. I guess that's the question that we need to be asking ourselves. To act and solve the problem or not to act and solve the problem. In all of this, in all of this, I would like to submit to you that Rehoboam would have known the commandments and the requirements of God. He would have read in Deuteronomy 8 verses 1 and 10 to 20 where God says, Every commandment which I command you today, you must be careful to observe that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord saw to your fathers. There's a conditional promise. If you and I will inherit eternity, we need to take heed to the mandate and the word of God. Psalm 1 and verse 1. Blessed is the man whose feet are planted in the word of God, who meditates day and night in his word. There's a blessing, Mildura Church, in meditating in the word of God. And so we are told, we are told that Shishak came and he cleaned Judah, he cleaned, cleaned out all of Judah. He took away the treasures of the house of the Lord, the treasures of the king's house. He took everything. He also carried away the gold shields that Solomon had made, though that splendid insignia that would sit, that would be placed on the walls in the temple. He took that away. And, can, and one of the saddest parts of this account is that after the gold shields have been carried away, Rehoboam made bronze ones to replace the gold. Bronze for gold. Can you imagine 
the embarrassment. Can you imagine the humiliation and the ridicule of the moms and dads, the, 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 the elderly folk, as they retell the story to their children that we used to have gold up there, but now, now this, we used to be a strong and mighty people. We used to have gold, but now we have bronze from a distance. When the sun catches the bronze shields and they glisten reflecting the sun rays, the superficial effect can be very satisfying from a distance. When you have put up the bronze and re when you put up bronze in the place of gold, from a distance it might appear as if everything is moving on well. Perhaps Rehoboam was thus satisfied. I've come to challenge Mildura Church today. Don't be satisfied with a superficial form of Christianity. Go deeper. Go deeper. Go for gold. Don't settle for that which is not gold. Perhaps there are some here today that can relate to this experience. I need to say it loud and clear. If there be gold in terms of the messages that we have as a church, keep it golden. If there be gold in the family principles that we have, keep it golden. If there be any gold in the word of God, keep it golden. Do not replace Gold for bronze. Bronze will give you the title and appearance of success, but can never furnish, furnish you with the character and the testimony of gold. In the words of a certain preacher, Pharaoh may have heard the title, but Moses had the testimony. Nebuchadnezzar may have had the title, but Daniel had the testimony of gold. Queen Jezebel may have had the title, but Elijah had the testimony of gold. Pilate may have had the testimony, but my Jesus, Pilate may have had the title, but my Jesus has the testimony. His name is wonderful counselor. He will never let you down. He is the prince of peace. You may know this peace even today. He is Emmanuel, God with us. May his favor go with you all the days of your life. I leave you with the words and testimony of one who did not always get it right but he got it right when it mattered the most. His legacy is that he came up tops when it mattered the most. Second Timothy. And I am considering chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Listen to Paul's valedictory speech. And he says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid upon for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on the day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So I leave you with these words. Go for gold. Don't settle for bronze. Bronze is always second best. Fight the good fight of faith. And God bless you all. So we remain standing for the benediction. 
indeed, Lord, it is our prayer that you would plant our feet on the higher ground of gold. Teach us, Lord, in all that we do and say, never to settle for bronze that is second best, but to always consider you, O oh God, that you bring to us and offer to us the best option ever. And so as a church, we decide for Jesus. We decide for Jesus today and forevermore. And to Mildura Church, I say to you, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you. The Lord cause everything that you do to be golden. The Lord help you to refuse the bronze now and forevermore in Jesus' name. Amen.